Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of As You Wish by Carrie Elwes. So, Carrie Elwes played, I think that's how you pronounce his name, I'm not 100%. But anyway, Carrie Elwes played Wesley in The Princess Bride. It's one of my favourite movies of all time. If you've seen the movie, you probably recognise the cover art and all that kind of stuff. The subtitle of this is Inconceivable Tales from the Making of the Princess Bride. It's also co-written with Joe Layden, who has written, like kind of helped celebrities and whatnot to write books in the past. It's a New York Times bestseller, forwarded by Rob Reiner, who directed it. But what's interesting as well is that it also has comments from all of the various cast members in it as well. So you can see those kind of greyed out boxes are comments from the cast members. Now that actually kind of made it difficult to read at times because you'd have the main kind of narrative of the book and one of those boxes at the like side by side and you know you need to turn the page but you haven't read the box and all this kind of stuff but I don't know how else you'd lay it out to be fair. I'm going to read the blurb. Storm the castle one more time. From celebrated actor Carrie Elwes, who played the iconic role of Wesley in The Princess Bride, comes a behind-the-scenes look at the making of the family favourite and cult classic film filled with never-before-told stories, exclusive photographs and interviews with co-stars Robin Wright, Wallace Shawn, Billy Crystal, Christopher Guest and Mandy Patinkin, as well as author and screenwriter William Goldman, producer Norman Lear and director Rob Reiner. In As You Wish, Elvis has created an enchanting experience for new and old fans of The Princess Bride, complete with plenty of set secrets and backstage stories. But what I will say is like the actual aesthetics of the book are beautiful. I mean, look at this here. And uh, it's got some specially designed fonts. For a start, I didn't realise how many other things uh, Carrie Elwes had been in. I, I knew he was in, uh, I think he was in Robin Hood and Men in Tights, maybe. And he was also in uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. I didn't realise he was in Saw. And then lots of other things like Twister, he was in Twister. And I, re I read on his Twitter recently, he's gonna be in the next season of, I hit myself in the face, he's gonna be in the next season of Stranger Things as well. Around the same time, Rob was putting the finishing touches on Stand By Me, an adaptation of a Stephen King novella that would be recognized as one of the best coming of age stories Hollywood has ever produced. Which is pretty cool. Rob Reiner also directed uh, This Is Spinal Tap, which is another great movie, one of my favorites. It's actually inspired a book I'm going to be working on shortly. At one point, Arnold Schwarzenegger was considered for the role of Fezzik, although it obviously went to Andre the Giant in the end. They also, when they went for their original meetings, it, it was just after the Chernobyl disaster, and they were meeting in Europe. And it, was, it says here that, uh, I have a distinct recollection of Andy being unnerved by the very prospect of being so close to Chernobyl that he didn't want to touch anything, let alone drink the water. The production designer Norman Garwood had worked with Terry Gilliam, so he'd worked on Time Bandits and Brazil. Very cool. He talks actually a lot about uh, Elwes is a big Monty Python fan and so was Robin Wright who played Buttercup and it's just something that they bonded on I guess but I've been ro watching a lot of a lot of Monty Python documentaries recently which is pretty cool. Also I didn't realise that Chris Sarandon played Prince Humperdinck or if I did I didn't realise that he's Susan Sarandon's ex-husband as well. So he says here actually he says uh my ex, this is Chris, Chris Sarandon writing here, he says, My ex-wife, Susan Sarandon, had done a movie with Robert Redford, and Redford at the time owned the film rights to the book. He wanted to make the movie and he gave a copy of it to her to read. I read it as well and I just flipped over it. There was such a wonderful combination of adventure, romance, satire and parody, having fun with different genres. And I just thought, this is amazing, I hope this movie gets made. But of course years went by and nothing happened. So jump cut to many years later and suddenly I get a call from one of my agents saying Rob Reiner and Bill Goldman want you to read for The Princess Bride for the role of Prince Humperdinck. And I went, oh my god, this is a dream come true. I love this book. I think it's good, like, it's clear that everyone who worked on the movie was a fan of the book as well. And Goldman himself, who is the, obviously the author of the book, he wrote the screenplay too. And he was so nervous. There were times, oh, we'll get to it in a bit actually. I like here it says, uh... Andre the Giant, he, he called everyone boss, and it was kind of a way of disarming them, because obviously he was like 7 foot 4 and 400 pounds or whatever. So he called everyone boss to kind of, you know what I mean, to imply a level of servitude, because he said that little kids, for example, never knew whether to run up to him or to run away from him. And he had that effect on a lot of people, and so it was part of his personality that he called people boss to try and disarm them and to charm them. I like this bit as well, he talks about when Wesley was in the pit of despair and he dies, and, and he writes here, he says, by the way, this was the moment in the writing of the book when Bill Goldman told me later he actually broke down and cried. He was so sad about Wesley's death. He said he loved the character so much and knew it worked, but he was also...
also concerned that he couldn't figure out a way to bring him back, so he shelved the book for a while until he could come up with a solution. He actually calls the solution he came up with, where Wesley is mostly dead, as one of the creative point highlights of his life. Here we have a bit about, yeah, a bit about um, Robin, what's her name, Robin Wright, and she's in House of Cards now, I want to say. But anyway, uh, so Ke uh, Carrie Elwes is writing about her and he says, An intelligent and beautiful young woman who loves Monty Python playing opposite me is Buttercup. Does it get much better than that? And looking around the table at the talent I was about to work with, I felt blessed to have been given this incredible opportunity. There were quite a lot of the people in the, in the film that kind of felt as though they weren't qualified to be there. They had imposter syndrome. Let me read you this little bit about Andre the Giant. Now, if you think Andre could eat, you should have seen him drink. It was legendary. Word had it that even before he developed the injury, he could drink 100 beers in one sitting. According to some estimates, his average daily consumption of alcohol was a case of beer, three bottles of wine, and a couple of bottles of brandy. But what I witnessed was something quite different. At mealtimes, besides the incredible amount of food he ate, I noticed that rather than using a regular glass, Andre drank from a beer pitcher, which looked a lot like a regular glass in his hands anyway. In reality, it was 40 ounces of alcohol, which he nicknamed the American usually some combination of hard and soft liquor and whatever else he felt like mixing it with that day. I should point out that not once did I notice any sign of the alcohol affecting him, which made sense given his size. So kids, don't try this at home or you'll most likely end up in the hospital. We have this bit here I want to read you about uh, one of the... In fact, I'll read you about this both because basically they had to put in a lot of training for the sword fight in the film. It was described in the screenplay as the greatest sword fight in history and basically... The two actors involved, Carrie Elwes and Mandy Patinkin, they were training day after day. They were even training in breaks during the filming schedule. And the, 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 I think the goal was, they said they were never going to be, you know, professional quality fencers, but they could look like it and, and they had four months to achieve that. Peter Diamond was a good three decades into what is generally regarded as one of the most legendary careers of any stuntman or stunt coordinator in both television and film. As a sword trainer, he had worked with both Errol Flynn and Burt Lancaster, and in the previous decade alone, he had served as stunt coordinator on the original Star Wars trilogy. For you Wikipedias reading this, the Tusken Raider that surprises young Luke Skywalker on the Tatooine clifftop with that horrifying scream, <laughs> that was Peter. He had also been the stunt arranger and coordinator on movies from, like From Russia With Love, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Highlander. Classically trained at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, Peter had also appeared in front of the camera, not only as a stuntman, but sometimes as an actor as well. That's him as the German soldier Indy notices in his side mirror, climbing along the side of the 80 mile an hour speeding truck without a harness in Raiders. Peter logged more than a thousand credits before passing away in 2004, at the age of 75. He was vibrant and actively employed until the last year of his life. So that's one of these two guys, here's the other one. Bob Anderson was also a native of England and he also something of a national hero, having served in the Royal Marines during World War II and as a representative of Great Britain on the fencing team in the 1952 Summer Olympics in Helsinki. He later became president of the British Academy of Fencing and a coach for the British national team. His expertise as a swordsman eventually took him to Hollywood, where he became a sought after stuntman and fight coordinator. The man's resume was breathtaking, from coaching Errol Flynn like Peter in the 1950s to choreographing fight scenes for several James Bond films in the 1960s and working alongside Peter and From Russia With Love and Star Warrior Alert on the Star Wars trilogy. That is Bob using the dark side of the force as Vader in all the lightsaber sequences. Bob also passed away in 2012 at the age of 90 but worked until the last serving as Swordmaster for Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy. I like this as well so Mandy Patinkin who played Inigo Montoya he says it was 1986. My father died in 1972. I read that script and I wanted to play Inigo because my mind immediately went, if I can get that six-fingered man, then I'll have my father back in my imaginary world. He'll be alive in my imagination. So that was it for me. It was like, I'll become the greatest sword fighter and my reward will not be to be in this movie that ended up being what it's become to all these people. My reward will be that my father will come back. So it's interesting, a case of art imitating life. They have this moment where they're trying to record and they can hear this like background noise and they're like, I don't know what it is, I don't know what it is. And they figure it out, it's Bill Goldman, the writer and screenwriter. And he's praying while they're trying to film because he's that concerned that you know he wants to do his book justice. And I think they did. Another thing that he did, even though he'd written the script and knew it was going to happen, when they actually filmed the scene in the fire swamp where Buttercup's dress gets set on fire, he, he'd forgotten all about it. It says, um, 
He'd forgotten, he'd apparently forgotten that this particular stunt was being shot that day and had left the set for some reason, missing the safety meeting, and returned right in the middle of the first take. As soon as he saw Robin on fire, he naturally thought that there had been some sort of an accident. Thus he yelled out something to the effect of, Oh my god, her dress is on fire, she's on fire! Effectively ruining another take. After yelling cut, Rob calmly turned to Goldman and said, Bill, it's supposed to catch on fire, remember? This was the first day of filming as well. They set fire to her on the first day of filming. Talks about where some of it was set, so uh, I'll just read this out. I think actually these two paragraphs are quite touching. So, After being given the weekend off to recover from our long shoot in the fire swamp, the whole crew packed up and travelled to our next location, Derbyshire's famous Peak District, arriving on the first day of September. A good deal of the movie was to be filmed in and around this area, most notably at Haddon Hall, an ancient manor home located on the River Wye in Bakewell. I can attest that it's almost impossible to visit Haddon Hall and not feel a sense of awe. In America, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of the fact that the world is an ancient place. The United States is, after all, but a few hundred years old, a veritable blip on the timepiece of Western civilization. In parts of Europe, though, there is no mistaking the history. It is palpable and overwhelming. Haddon Hall has a very rich history. The place cannot be measured in years or even decades, but in centuries. You can feel the ghosts of medieval times. They practically whisper from the walls. It's funny as well, he talks about how Andrew the Giant, he was very uncomfortable in hot weather, but he was fine with cold. And that's a lot like me as well. I'm going to read this out. This is a uh, comment from Andy Scheinman. He says, Andre was a very sweet and friendly man, but he did frighten people sometimes. Robin Wright completely freaked out the first time she met him. She ran out of her dressing room in a panic. It was actually pretty funny. She didn't know who he was or what was going on. She just saw this giant man and ran away in a panic. I felt terrible for Andre, but he didn't seem to mind. He used to say that with children, half of them run away when they see me, half jump on my lap. Even the biggest, baddest dogs were afraid of him. Maybe they thought he was a bear or something. And that was just part of his life, part of his everyday experience. That people and animals, everyone and everything, reacted differently to him. It was quite sad, uh... He said, well, Mandy Patinkin says about him here, he was constantly being mobbed for autographs and pictures by people. And I remember one particular day watching him wait patiently while a hundred or so members of the crew brought their families to the set and stood in line like tourists at Disneyland to meet him. And he let every single one of them take a photo with him. But he did say that, um, you know, he, he wished that pe he could just have one day where people just looked at him normally, you know, because he could never go anywhere without being noticed. Even if it wasn't as a celebrity, it was as a giant, you know. And what's particularly weird, actually, when he was a kid, he, he wasn't allowed in the school bus because he was too heavy. So he used to get lifts from Samuel Beckett because Samuel Beckett used to live there and he had a convertible. So it was the only vehicle in the town that could give Andre a lift. So the, the, the young Andre the Giant got lifts to school from Samuel Beckett. How cool. So he says... He says here, And so, for a time at least, the Nobel Prize winning author of Waiting for Godot chauffeured the young man who would eventually become the most famous wrestler in history to and from school. You have lots of great images inside as well from the set and also from the, you know, actors live. So here's Andre the Giant with a bunch of schoolgirls, for example. Living the dream there. We have uh, Billy Crystal when he played Miracle Max. His outtakes were so funny that Rob Reiner and Carrie Elwes had to go and stand outside because otherwise their voices, their laughter was heard on the audio. And here he is meeting both the Pope and Bill Clinton. As you do. We have uh, the food that they were getting from the caterers was so bad that they started getting these little grills in their hotel rooms. <laughs> oh, we have this bit as well. You know, in the bit in the film where uh, Christopher Guest is Count Rugen, he, he hits Wesley on the head with a sword. He goes up and knocks him out. That was real. So <laughs> basically, they'd been doing these takes where they went behind or whatever like that and faked it. And it just didn't look good enough. So Carrie Elwes was like, just hit me properly. Just do it properly. So Christopher Guest hit him properly and actually knocked him out. And then he woke up in, in the hospital with a concussion. So in the film, that's the take that you see when he falls to the floor. He has actually been knocked out. I think what's really sweet as well here is that Elwes says while, while they were filming, his granddad was basically terminally ill and he was in hospital. And Elwes went to visit him there and he was telling him stories about the shoot and whatnot. And he realised that it was, again, it was art imitating life except or, or the other way around. But, and it was actually the other way around because in the film, you've got the granddad reading the book to the poorly grandson, whereas this was the grandson you know, talking about the same story effectively with the poorly granddad. I'm going to read you this quote from Rob Reiner, the director. He says, 
So we've got to do this scene where we had to have them on the four horses and they were going to be suspended so we shot it against black. It was going to be a visual effect. Well, Andre weighed like 500 pounds so he couldn't just sit on any horse. We had to rig a system where we would lower him down with pulleys and we'd paint the cables out so he would just be resting on the horse. So we got to the end of the day and it's about 8 o'clock at night and I'm walking to the sound stage where we're going to shoot this and they open the doors and I see a 500 pound giant being lowered from the ceiling and he's going, hello boss! And I'm thinking, what do I do for a living here? What is this job that I have? It was pretty crazy. And then when it actually came to the movie being released, it was kind of messed up by the marketing departments. They didn't really know how to promote it. Oh, let's, I'm going to tell you this story about basically after the, all the filming had finished, Elwes went out drinking with Andre the Giant in New York City and they're being followed from, from bar to bar by this guy. So um, Andre has a look at it, at this guy, and he goes, he's a cop. Of what? I responded, clearly confused. A policeman, he replied. It turns out that on one of the nights out bar hopping, Andre had had a bit too much to drink, and while he was waiting for his car from the valet, he simply slipped and fell over. But he didn't just fall on his butt, he fell right on top of a very surprised patron. I can only imagine what that felt like for the poor and suspecting fellow, who must have thought a building and landed on him. It could have turned out to be a major lawsuit, but I think the whole thing was settled fairly quickly and quietly. After that, the NYPD decided that whenever Andre went out for a drink, they would send one of their finest to follow him and make sure that they didn't fall on anyone again. I'm going to read this this feedback from this quote from Rob Reiner here. I've had many encounters with many people from all walks of life who love the movie, but the strangest had to be this one. One night, Nora Ephron and her husband, Nick Pelleggi, who wrote the screenplay to the movie Goodfellas, wanted to take me to a restaurant in New York where the mobster John Gotti liked to eat. So we went, and sure enough, in walks Gotti with six wise guys. After we finish the meal, I walk outside and there's one of these Goodfellas standing in front of a huge limo who looked just like Luca Brasi from The Godfather. He looks down at me and he goes, Hey! You killed my father! Prepare to die! And I just froze. Then he starts laughing and says, The Princess Bride! I love that movie! I almost fell over right in the street. So we have this quote here from Fred Savage who played the grandson. And what's kind of sad is that him and I think it was Peter Falk who played Columbo, but he also played the granddad in the movie. And they didn't get to meet the rest of the cast because they filmed all of their scenes separately. But we have this nice thing here by Fred Savage. He says, I remember years ago, I think I was in high school or just in college. I ran into Mandy, just completely randomly walking past him on the street. We had never met since we didn't share one minute of screen time and we had nothing in common other than this movie and I was like, I think we have to hug, right? We're both part of this thing and we did, we hugged and I felt this real connection with him because this thing just pulled all these people together. I feel like my experience was unique in that I wasn't part of the camaraderie of the filmmaking. It was very separate in the film and in the shooting and so I never met most of these people but we still have this common experience that's kind of forever linked us all. And I think that's a nice sweet way to end this. So it's rating time. I'm going to give this a solid 5 out of 5. I mean, I'm probably biased here because, like I say, it is one of my favourite movies. But actually, it was really well written. Very fascinating as well. If you're a fan of The Princess Bride and you want to learn more about it, definitely check out this book. If you're not a fan of The Princess Bride, go and watch the movie and fix that. In fact, that was my advice on Goodreads. If you're a fan of The Princess Bride, definitely read this. If you're not a fan of The Princess Bride, go and read The Princess Bride by William Goldman. Go and watch the movie and then read this. So yeah. So on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Let me know if you've seen The Princess Bride as well because why not? Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.